Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Pandora, and Bella. It's always want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy. Hit the like button, subscribe, comment below. Hit the notification bell and please stay cool. It's hot summer. And without further ado, let's get to Stephen King's It. Okay, so we are on chapter six, part four, or category now in part two of Stephen King's It. Alrighty. All right, here we go. Before he could make it, Henry stepped uh, forward and gave him a shove. Ben flew back with the rail and creaked more loudly this time and he felt it give a little under his weight. Belts and Victor grabbed him again. Now you hold him. Henry said, you hear me? Sure, Henry, Belts said. He sounded a trifle uneasy. He ain't gonna get away. Don't worry. Henry stepped forward until his flat stomach almost touched Ben's belly. Ben stared at him, tears spilling helplessly out of his wide eyes. Caught. I'm caught. A part of his mind Yammered. He tried to stop it. He couldn't think at all with the that yammering going on, but it wouldn't stop. Caught, caught, caught. Henry pulled out the blade, which was long and wide and graved with his name. A tip glittered in the afternoon sunshine. I'm going to test you now, Henry said in that same reflective voice. It's exam time, tits, and you better be ready. Ben wept. He, His heart thundered madly in his chest, snot ran out of his nose and collected on his upper lip. His library books lay in a scatter at his feet. Henry stepped on bulldozer, glanced down, dealt it into the gutter with a side swipe of one black engineer boot. Here's the first question on your exam, tits. When somebody says, let me copy during finals, what are you going to say? Yes, Ben exclaimed immediately. Going to say yes, sure, okay, copy all you want. The buck's tip slid through two inches of air and pressed against Ben's stomach. It was as cold as an ice cube tray just out of the frigid air. Ben gasped his belly away from it. For a moment, the world went gray, yet Henry's mouth was moving, but Ben couldn't tell what was he, what he was saying. Henry was like a TV with the sound turned off, and the world was swimming, swimming. Don't you dare faint, the panicky voice shrieked. You faint, he may get mad enough to kill you. The world came back into some kind of focus. He saw that both Belch and Victor had stopped laughing. They looked nervous, almost scared, seeing that had the effect of a Head clearing slap on Ben. All of a sudden, they don't know what he's going to do or how far he's far he might go. However, had you thought things were, however bad you thought things were, that's how bad they really are. Maybe even a little worse. You got to think. If you never did before or never do again, you better think now, because his eyes say they're right to look nervous. His eyes say he's crazy as a bed bug. That's the wrong answer, Tits, Henry said. If just anyone says, let me copy, I don't give a fuck what you do. Got it? Yes, Ben said, his, belt, his belly hitching with sobs. Yes, I got it. Well, okay, that's one wrong, but the biggies are still coming up. You re ready for the biggies? I, I guess so. A car came slowly toward them. It was a dusty fi 51 Ford with an old man and a woman propped up in the front seat like a pair of neglected apartments to a mannequin. Ben saw the old man's Head turned slowly toward him. Henry stepped closer to Ben, hiding the knife. Ben could feel its point dimpling his, fresh, his flesh just above his belly button. It was still cold. He didn't see how that could be, but it was. Go ahead. Yell, Henry said. You'll be picking your fucking guts off your sneakers. They were close enough to kiss. Ben could smell the sweet smell of juicy fruit gum on Henry's breath. The car passed and continued on down Kansas Street, a slow and serene as the, as the pace car in the Tournament of Roses parade. All right, Tits, here's the second question. If I say, let me copy during finals, what are you going to say? Yes, I'll say yes right away. Henry smiled. That's good. You got that one right, Tits. Now, here's the third question. How am I going to be sure you never forget that? I, I don't know, Ben whispered. Henry smiled. His face lit up and was for a moment almost handsome. I know, he said, as if he had discovered a great truth. I know, Tits. I'll carve my name on your big fat gut. Victor and Belts abruptly began laughing, and for a moment Ben 
felt a species of bewildered relief, thinking it had all been nothing but make-believe. A little shuck and jive, the three of them had whomped up to scare the living hell out of him, but Henry Bowers wasn't laughing, and Ben suddenly understood that Henry and Belts were laughing because they were relieved, because that Victor and Belts were laughing because they were relieved. It was obvious to both of them that Henry couldn't be serious, except Henry was. The buck knife slid upward, smooth as butter, blood welled in a bright red line of Ben's pallid skin. Hey, Victor cried. The word came out muffled in a startled gulp. Hold him, Henry snarled. You just hold him. Hear me. Now, there was nothing grave and uh, reflective on Henry's face. Now was the twisted face of a devil. Jeez, I'm crow, Henry. Don't really cut him, Belt screamed, and his voice was high, almost the girl's voice. Everything happened fast then, but to Ben Hanscom, all seemed, it all seemed slow. It all seemed to happen in a series of shutter clicks, like action stills in a Life magazine photo e essay. His panic was gone. He had discovered something inside him suddenly, and because it had no use for panic, that something just ate the panic hole. In the first shutter click, Henry had snatched his sweatshirt all the way up to his nipples. Blood was pouring from the shallow vertical cut above his belly button. In the second shutter click, Henry drew the knife down again, operating fast like a lunatic battle surgeon under an aerial bombardment. Fresh blood flowed. Backward, Ben thought, coldly as blood flowed down and pooled between the waistband of his jeans and his skin. Got to go backward. That's the only direction I can get away in. Belch and Victor went, weren't holding him anymore. In spite of Henry's command, they just had drawn... Him. They had drawn away in horror, but if he ran, Bowers would catch him. In the third shutter click, Henry connected the two vertical slashes with a short horizontal line. Ben could feel blood running into his underpants now when a sticky snail trail was, uh, was creeping down his left thigh. Henry leaned back momentarily, frowning with the studied concentration of an artist playing, painting a landscape. After H comes E, Ben thought, and that was all it took to get him moving. He pulled forward a little bit, and Henry shoved him back again. Ben <clears throat> pushed with his legs, adding his own force to Henry's. He hit the whitewashed railing between Kansas Street and the drop into the Barrens. As he did, he raised his right foot and planted it in Henry's belly. This was not a retaliatory act. Ben only wanted to crease his back with force, and yet when he saw the expression of utter surprise in Henry's face, he was filled with a clear savage joy, a feeling so intense that for a split second he thought the top of his head was going to come off. Then there was a cracking, splint splintering sound from the railing. Ben saw Victor and Belch catch Henry before he could fall on his ass in the gutter next to the remains of bulldozer. <coughs> and then Ben was falling backward into space. He went with a scream that was half a laugh. <coughs> Ben hit the slope on his back and buttocks just below the culvert he had spotted earlier. It was a good thing he had landed below it. If he had landed on it, he might well have broken his back. As it was, he landed on a thick cushion of weeds and bracken and barely felt the impact. He did a backward somersault, feet and legs snapping over his head. He landed sitting up and went sliding down the slope backward like a kid on a big green Shoot the shoot. His sweatshirt pulled up around his neck, his hands grabbing for purchase and doing nothing but yanking out tuft after tuft of bracken and witch grass. He saw the top of the embankment. It seemed impossible that he had just been standing up there, receding with crazy cartoon speed. He saw Victor and Belts there, faces round white O's, staring down at him. He had time to mourn his library books. Then he fetched up against something with the agonizing force and nearly bit his tongue in half. It was a down treat, and it checked Ben's fall by nearly breaking his leg. He clawed his way back up the slope a little bit, pulling his leg free with a groan. The tree had stopped him about a half way down. Below the bushes were thicker. Water falling from the culvert ran over his hands into his thin stream. There was a shriek from above him. Ben looked up again and saw Henry Bowers come flying over the drop, his, head, his knife clenched between his teeth. He landed on both feet, both body, body thrown backward at a steep angle so he would not overbalance. He skidded to the end of a 
gigantic set of footprints and then began to run down the embankment in a series of, of gangling kangaroo leaps. I'm going to kill you, ooh, it, Henry was shrieking around, shrieking around the knife and Ben didn't need a UN translator to tell him Henry was saying, I'm going to kill you, tits. I'm going to uck and kill you, kill you. Now with that cold general's eye, he had discovered up above to the sidewalk. Ben saw what he had to do. He managed to gain his feet just before Henry arrived. The knife now in his hand and held straight out in front of him like a bayonet. Ben was peripherally aware that the left leg of his jeans was shredded, and his leg was bleeding much more heavily than his stomach. But it was supporting him, and that meant it was bro wasn't broken. At least he hoped that's what it meant. <coughs> ben crouched slightly to maintain his precarious balance, and as Henry grabbed at him with one hand and swept the knife in a long, flat arc with the other, Ben stopped, stepped aside. He lost his balance, but as he fell down, he stuck out his shredded left leg. Henry's shin struck it, and his legs were booted out from under him with great efficiency. For a moment, Ben gasped, his terror overcome with a mixture of awe and admiration. Henry Bowers appeared to be flying exactly like Superman over the falling, fallen tree where Ben had stopped. His arms were straight out in front of him, the way George Reeves held his arms out in the TV show. Only George Reeves always looked like flying. It was his natural to take a bath reading lunch on the back porch. Henry looked like someone had shoved a hot poker up his ass. His mouth was opening and closing. A string of saliva was shooting back from one corner of it, and as Ben watched it, splattered against the lobe of Henry's ear. Then Henry crashed back to earth. The knife flew out of the, his hand. He rolled over on one shoulder landed on his back and slid away into the bushes with his legs splayed into a V. There was a yell, a thud, and then silence. Ben sat dazed, looking at the matted pl place in the bushes where Henry had done his disappearing act. Suddenly, rocks and pebbles began to bounce by him. He looked up again. Victor and Belch were now descending the embankment. They were moving more carefully than Henry, and hence more slowly, but they would reach him in 30 seconds or less if he didn't do something. He moaned. Would his, this lunacy never end? Keeping his eye on them, he clambered over the down tree and began to scramble down the embankment, panting harshly. He had a stitch in his side. His tongue hurt like hell. The bushes were now almost as tall as Ben himself. The randy green smell of stuff growing out of control filled his nose. He could hear running water somewhere close, chuck, uh, chuckling over stones and rilling between them. His feet slipped, and here he went again, rolling and sliding, smashing the back of his hand against a jutting rock, shooting through a patch of thorns that looked like blue-gray puffs of cotton from his sweatshirt, and little divots of meat from his hands and cheeks. He slammed into a jarring halt, sitting up. With his feet in the water, here was a little curving stream which wound its way into a thick stand of uh, second growth trees to his right. It looked as dark as a cave in there. He looked to his left and saw Henry Bowers lying on his back in the middle of the stream. His half-open eyes showed only whites. Blood trickled from one ear and then ran towards Ben in delicate threads. Oh my God, I killed him. God, a murderer. Oh my God, forgetting that Belch and Victor were behind him, perhaps understanding they would lose all interest in beating the crap out of him when they discovered their fearless leader was dead, but splashed 20 feet upstream to where Henry lay, his shirt and ribbons, his jeans soaked back, one shoe gone. Ben was vaguely aware that there was precious little devil, little left of his own clothes, and that his body was one big rattle trap of aches and pains. His left ankle was the worst. It had already puffed tight against a soaking sneaker, and he was favoring it so badly that he was really not walking but lurching like a sailor on shore for the first time after a long time sea voyage. He bent over Henry Bowers. Henry's eyes popped wide open. He grabbed Ben's cap with one scrape and bloody hand. His mouth worked, and, and although nothing but a series of whistling aspirations emerged, Ben could still make out what he was saying. Kill, kill who, kill who, you fat crap. Henry was trying to pull himself up, using Ben's leg as a pole. Ben pulled toward frantically. Henry's hand slipped down, then off. Ben flew backward, whirling his arms, and fell on his butt for a record-breaking third time in the last four minutes. He also bit his tongue again. 
Water splashed up around him. A rainbow glimmered for an instant in front of Ben's eyes. Ben didn't give a crap about the rainbow. Ben didn't give a crap about finding a pot of gold. He would settle for his miserable fat life. Henry rolled over, tried to stand, fell back, managed to get to his hands and knees, and finally tottered to his feet. He stared at Ben with those black eyes. The front of his flat top now leaned this way and that like horn husks after a white after a high wind had passed through. Ben was suddenly angry. No, this was more than being angry. He was infuriated and walking with his library books under his arms, having an innocent little daydream about kissing Bether Beverly Marsh, bothering nobody. And look at this, just look, pants shredded, left ankle maybe broken, badly sprained for sure, leg all cut up, tongue all cut up, Henry goddamn Bowers monogram on his stomach, how about all that happy crappy sports fans? But it was probably the thought of his library books, for which he was liable that drove him to charge Henry Bowers, his lost library books, and his mental image of how reproachful Mrs. Starrett's eyes would become when he told her. Whatever the reason, cut sprain, library books, or even the thought of the soggy and probably illegible rank card in his back pocket, it was enough to get him moving. He lumbered forward, squashy, kids spatting in the, in the shallow water and kicked Henry squarely in the, in the nads. Henry uttered a, sh a horrid, rusty scream that sent birds beating up from the trees. He stood spraddle-legged for a moment, Henry, hands clasp, clasping his crotch, staring unbelievably at Ben. Ugh, he said in a small voice. Right, Ben said. Ugh, Henry said in an even smaller voice. Right, Ben said again. Henry sank slowly back to his knees, not so much falling as folding up. He was still looking at Ben with those unbelieving black eyes. Ugh, damn right, Ben said. D Henry fell on his side, still clutching his testicles, and began to roll slowly from side to side. Ugh, Henry moaned. My jewels, ugh, oh, you broke my jewels, ugh, ugh. He was now beginning to gain a little force, and Ben started to back away step at a time. He was sickened by what he had done, but he was also filled with a kind of righteous, paralyzed fashion. Ugh, my flipping sack, ugh, ugh, oh my flipping sack and balls. Ben might have remained in the area for an untold length of time, perhaps even under Henry, until Henry recovered enough to come after him, but just just then a rock struck him above the right ear with such a deep, drilling pain that until he felt warm blood flowing again, Ben thought he had been stung by a wasp. He turned and saw the other two starting up the middle of the stream toward him. They each had a handful of water-rounded rocks. Victor pegged one and Ben heard it while whistle past his ear. He ducked and another struck his right knee, making him yell with surprised hurt. A third bounced off his right cheekbone and that and that eye uh, filled with water. He scrambled for the far bank and climbed it as fast as he could, grabbing onto protruding roots and hauling on handfuls of bushes. He made it to the top. One, fi one final stone struck his buttocks as he pulled himself up and took a quick look back over his shoulder. Belts was kneeling beside Henry while Victor stood half a dozen feet away, firing stones, one the size of a baseball clipped through the, the man high bushes beside Ben. He had seen enough, in fact. He had seen much more than enough. Worst of all, Henry Bowers was getting up again, like Ben's own Timex watch. Henry could take a licking and keep on ticking. Ben turned and smashed his way into the bushes, lumbering along in a direction he hoped was west. If he could cross to the old Cape side of the Barrens, he could beg a dime off somebody and take the uh, bus home. And when he got there, he would lock the door behind him and bury these tattered, bloody clothes in the trash. And this crazy dream would finally be... Over, Ben thought of himself sitting in his chair in the living room, freshly tubbed, wearing his fuzzy red bathrobe, watching Daffy Duck cartoons on the mighty 90 and drinking milk through a strawberry flavor straw. Hold that thought, he told himself, grimly, and kept lumbering along. Bushes sprang into his face. Ben pushed them aside. Thorns reached and clawed. He tried to ignore them. He came to a flat area of ground that was bl black and mucky. Quick, a, me, a thick stand of bamboo-like growth spread across it, and a fetid smell rose from the earth, an ominous thought. Quicksand slipped across the foreground of his mind like a shadow as he looked at the sheen of standing water deeper into the grove of bamboo stuff. 
He didn't want to go in there, even if it wasn't quicksand. The mud would suck his sneakers off. He turned right instead, running along the front of the bamboo grove and finally into a patch of real woods. The trees, mostly firs, were thick, growing everywhere, battling each other for a little space and sun. But there was uh, less undergrowth, and he could move faster. He was no longer sure what direction he was moving in, but still thought he was, on measure, a little ahead of the game. The barons were enclosed by dairy on three sides and bounded by the half-finished turnpike extension on the fourth. Sooner or later, he would come out somewhere. His stomach throbbed painfully, and he pulled up the remains of his sweatshirt for a look. He winced and drew a whistle of air in over his teeth. His belly looked like a grotesque Christmas tree ball, all caked red blood and smeared green from his slide down from slide down the embankment. He pulled the sweatshirt down again, looking at that mess made him feel like blowing lunch. Now he heard a low humming noise from ahead. It was one steady note just above the low range of its hearing, an adult intent only on getting the hell out of there. Mosquitoes had found Ben down. While nowhere near as big as sparrows, they were pretty big. Would have ignored it or simply not heard it at all. But Ben was a boy. He was already getting over his fright. He swerved to his left and pushed through some low laurel bushes, beyond them sticking out of the ground, with the top three feet of a cement cylinder above four feet about four feet wide. It was capped with a vented iron manhole cover. The cover was sw- stamped with the words Dairy Sewer Department. The sound this close the sound this close was more it was more of a drone than a hum. It was coming from someplace deep inside. Ben put one eye to a vent hole but could see nothing. He could hear that drone and water running down there someplace, but that was all. He took a breath, got a whiff of a sour smell that was both dank and shitty, and uh, drew back with a wince. It was a sewer. That was all. Or maybe a combined sewer and drainage runnel tunnel. There were plenty of those in flood, conscious dairy. No big deal, but it had given him a funny sort of chill. Part of it was seeing the handiwork of man in all this overgrown jumble. A wilderness, but he supposed part of it was the shape of the thing itself. That concrete cylinder jutting out of the ground. Ben had read H.G. Wells' The Time Machine the year before. First the classic, uh, classics comics version, and then the whole book. The cylinder, with its vented iron cap, reminded him of the well, which wells which led down into the country the slumped in horrible moorlocks. He moved away from it quickly, trying to find the west again. He got to a little clearing and turned until his shadow was as directly behind him as he could get it. Then he headed off as in a straight line. Five minutes later, he heard more running water ahead and, vo- and voices, kids' voices. He stopped to listen, and that was when he heard snapping branches. And the other voices behind him, they were perfectly recognizable. They belonged to Victor Belch and the one and only Henry Bowers. The nightmare was not over yet, it seemed. Ben looked around for a place to go to Earth. And... Part 10 of Chapter 4. He came out of his hiding place about two hours later, dirtier than ever, but a little refreshed. Incredible as it seemed to him, he had dozed off. When he had heard the three of them behind him coming after him still, Ben had come dangerously close to freezing up completely like an animal caught in the headlamps of an oncoming truck. A paralytic drowsiness began to steal over him. The idea of simply lying down, curling up into a ball like a hedgehog, and letting them do whatever they felt they they had to had to occur to him. It was a crazy idea, but it also seemed like a strangely good idea. But instead, Ben began to move toward the sound of the running water, and those other kids. He tried to untangle their voices and get the sense of what they were saying. Anything to shake off that scary paralysis of the spirit. Some project they were talking about. Some project. One of the two voices were even a little familiar. There was a splash followed by a burst of good-natured laughter. The laughter filled Ben with a kind of stupid longing. It made him more aware of his dangerous position than anything else had done. If he was going to be caught, there was no need to let these kids in for a dose of his medicine. Ben turned right away, turned right again. Like many large people, he was remarkably light-footed. He passed close enough to the boys to see their shadows moving back and forth between him and the bright water, but they neither saw him nor heard him. Gradually, their voices began to fall behind. He came to a narrow path which had been beaten down to the bare earth. Ben 
considered it for a moment, then shook his head a little. He crossed it and plunged into the underground growth again. He moved more slowly now, pushing bushes aside rather than stampeding through them. He was still moving roughly parallel to the stream the other kids had been playing beside, even through the intervening bushes and trees he could see it was much wider than the one into which he and Henry had fallen. Here was another of these those concrete cylinders barely visible in the snarl of blackberry creepers humming quietly to itself. Beyond an embankment dropped off to the street stream and here an old gnarled elm tree leaned crookedly out over the water, its roots half, ex half exposed by bank erosion looked like a snarl of dirty hair, hoping there wouldn't be bugs or snakes, but too tired and numbly frightened to really care. Ben had worked his way between the roots and into a shadow, shallow cave beneath. He leaned back. A root jabbed him like an angry finger. He shifted his position a little and it supported him quite nicely. Here came Henry Belton, Belch and Victor. He had thought that they might be fooled into following the path, but no such luck. They stood close by him for a moment and closer. Any closer, and he could have reached out of his hiding place and re touched them. Well, let's go find out, Henry replied, and they headed back the way they had come. A few moments uh, later, Ben heard him roar, What the fudge the you kids doing here? There was some sort of reply, but Ben couldn't tell what it was. The kids were too far away, and this close to the river, it was the Kanduskeg, of course, was too loud, but he thought the kid sounded scared. Ben could sympathize. Then Victor Chris bellowed something Ben hadn't understood at all. What a flippin' baby damn. Baby damn, baby damn. Maybe Victor had said, what a, what a damn bunch of babies. And <clears throat> Ben had misheard him. Let's break it, Belch proposed. There were t yells of protest followed by a scream of pain. Someone began to cry. Yes, Ben could sympathize. They hadn't been able to catch him, or at least not yet. But here was another bunch of little kids for them to take out their mat on. Sure, break it, Henry said, splashes, yells, big moronic gusts of laughter from Belt and Victor, an agonized and infuriated cry from one of the little kids. Don't give me any of your crap, you stuttering little freak, Henry Bowers said. I ain't taking no more crap from any, nobody today. There was a splintering crack. The sound of running water downstream grew, loud, grew louder and roared briefly before quieting to its former... Placid uh, chuckled. Ben suddenly understood. Baby damn, yes, that was what Victor had said. The kids, two or three of them, it had sounded like when he had passed by, had been building the dam. Henry and his friends had just kicked it apart. Ben even thought he knew who one of the kids was. The only stuttering little freak he knew from dairy school was Bill Denborough, who was in the other fifth grade classroom. You didn't have to do that. A thin and fearful voice cried out. And Ben recognized that voice as well, although he could not immediately put a face with it. What did you, why did you do that? Because I felt like it. Fudge nut, Henry roared back. It was a meaty thud. It was follow, followed by a scream of pain. The scream was followed by weeping. Shut, shut up, Victor said. Shut up that crying kid. I'll pull your ears down and tie him under your chin. The crying began a series of choked snuffles. We're going. We are going, Henry said. But before we do, I want to know one thing. You've seen a fat kid in this last... Ten minutes or so, big fat kid all bloody and cut up. There was a reply to br too brief to be anything but no. You sure, Belch asked? You better be, mushmouth. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sure, Bill Denver replied. Let's go, Henry said. He probably waited the cross back that way. Ta-ta, boys, Victor, Chris called. It was a real baby dam. Believe me, you're better off without it. Splashing sounds. Belch's voice came again. But farther away now, Ben couldn't make out the words. In fact, he didn't want to make out the words. Closer by, the boy who had been crying now resumed. There was, there were accompanying noises from the other boy. Ben had decided there was just the two of them, stuttering Bill and the weeper. He half sat, half lay where he was listening to the two boys by the river and the fading sounds of Henry and his dinosaur friends crashing toward the far side of the barrens. Sunlight flicked at his eyes and made little coins of lights on the tangled roots above and around him. It was dirty in here, but it was also cozy, safe. The sound of running water was soothing. 
Even the sound of the crying kid was sort of soothing. His aches and pains had faded to a dull throb, and the sound of the dinosaurs had faded out completely. He would wait a while, just to be sure they weren't coming back, and then he would make tracks. Ben could hear the throb of the drainage machinery coming through the earth, could even feel it a low, steady vibration that went from the ground to the root he was leaning against and then into his back. He thought of the Morlocks again, of their naked flesh. He imagined it would smell like the dank and crappy air that had come up through the vent holes of, the iron, of that iron cap. He thought of the wells driven deep into the earth, wells with the rusty ladders bolted to their sides. He dozed, and at some point his thoughts became a dream. Part 11 of Chapter 4 it wasn't Morlocks he dreamed of. He dreamed of the thing which had happened to him in January, the thing which he, had, he hadn't quite been able to tell his mother. It had been the first day of school after the long Christmas break. Mrs. Douglas had asked for a volunteer to stay after and help her count the books that had been turned in just before the vacation. Ben had raised his hand. Thank you, Ben, Mrs. Douglas had said, favoring him with a smile of such brilliance that it warmed him down to his toes. Suck butt, Henry Bowers remarked remark under his breath. It had been the the sort of main winter day that is both the best and the worst. Cloudless, eye-wateringly bright, but so cold it was a little frightening. Oh, those days. To make the 10-degree temperature worse, there was a strong wind to give the cold a bitter cutting edge. Ben caught it, counted books and called out numbers. Mrs. Douglas wrote them down, not bothering to double-check his work, even on a random basis. He was proud to note. And then they both carried the books down to the storage room, through halls where radiators clanked dreamily. At first, the school had been full of sounds, slamming locker doors, the clickety-clack of Mrs. Thomas's typewriter upstairs, typewriter, she was a typewriter in the office, the slightly off-key choral renditions of the glee club upstairs, the nervous thud, thud, thud of basketballs from the gym, and the scooch and thud of sneakers as players drove toward the baskets or cut turns on the polished wood floor, turns on the polished wood floor. Little by little, these sounds ceased until his last set of books was totted up, one short, but it hardly mattered, Mrs. Douglas sighed. They were all holding together on a wing and a prayer. The one sounds, the only sounds were the radiators, the faint wish-wish of Mr. Fazio's broom as he pushed colored sawdust up the hall floor and the, ho and the howl of the wind outside. Ben looked toward the books room, book room's one narrow window and saw that the light was fading rapidly from the sky. It was four o'clock and dusk was at hand. Membranes of dry snow blew around the icy jungle gem and scurled, around, scurled between the teeter-totters which were frozen solid into the ground. Only the thaws of April could break those bitter winter welds. He saw no one at all on Jackson Street. He looked at it a moment longer, expecting a car to roll through the jackson Witcham intersection, but none did. Everyone in Derry, save himself and Mrs. Douglas, might be dead or f fled, at least from what he could see from here. He looked toward her and saw with a touch of real fright that she was feeling almost exactly the same things he was feeling himself. He could tell by the look in her eyes. They were deep and thoughtful and far off. Not the eyes of a school teacher in her forties, but those of a child. Her hands were folded just below her breast as if in prayer. I'm scared, Ben thought. And she's scared, and she's scared too, but what are we really scared of? He didn't know. Then she looked at him and uttered a short, almost embarrassed laugh. I've kept you too late, she said. I'm sorry, Ben. That's okay, he looked down at his shoes. He loved her a little, not with the frank, unquestioning love he had lavished on Miss Thibodeau, his first grade teacher, but he did love her. If I drove, I'd give you a ride, she said, but I don't. My husband's going to pick me up around quarter past five. If you'd care to wait, we could. No, thanks, Ben said. I ought to get home before... Th for then. This was, this was not really the truth, but he felt a queer aversion to the idea of meeting Mrs. Douglas's husband. Maybe your mother could. She doesn't drive either, Ben said. I'll be all right. It's only a mile home. A mile's not far when it's nice, but it can be very long way in this weather. You'll go in somewhere if it gets too cold, won't you, Ben? Oh, sure. I'll go into Costello's Market and stand by the stove a little while or something. Mr. Gedrow doesn't mind, and I got my snow pants, my new Christmas scarf, too. This is Douglas. <laughs> Looked a little reassured, and then she glanced toward the window again. It just looks so cold out there, she said, so, so inimical. He didn't know the word. 
but he knew exactly what she meant. Something just happened. What? He had seen her, he realized, suddenly as a person instead of just a teacher. That was what had happened. Suddenly he had seen her face in an entirely different way. And because he did, it be did it, and because he did, it became a new face, the face of a tired poet. He could see her going home with her husband, sitting beside him in the car with her hands folded as the heater hissed and he talked about his day. He could see her making them dinner, an odd thought crossed his mind, and a cocktail party question rose to his lips. Do you have children, Mrs. Douglas? I often think at this time of the year that people really weren't meant to live this far north of the equator, she said. At least not in this latitude. Then she smiled, and some of the strangeness either went out of her face or her eye, or his eye. He was able to see her at least partially, as he always had, but you'll never see her that way again. Not completely, he thought, dismayed. I'll feel old until spring, and then I'll feel young again. It's that way every year. Are you sure you'll be all right, Ben? I'll be fine. Yes, I suppose you will. You're a good boy, Ben. He looked back at his toes, flushing, blushing, loving her more than ever. In the hallway, Mr. DeFazio said, Be careful of the frostbite boy without looking up from his red sawdust. I will. He reached his locker, opened it, and yanked out on his snow pants. He had been painfully unhappy when he, when his mother insisted he wear them again this winter on especially cold days, thinking of them as baby clothes. But he was glad to have them this afternoon. He walked slowly toward the door, zipping his coat, yanked the drawstrings of his hood tight, pulling on his mittens. He went out and stood on the snow pat top step of the front stairs for a moment, listening as the door snicked closed and locked behind him. Derry, school brooded under a bruised skin of sky. The wind blew steadily. The snap hooks on the flagpole rope rattled the lonesome tattoo against the steel pole itself. That wind cut into the warm and unprepared flesh of Ben's face at once, numbing his cheeks. Be careful of the frostbite, boy. He quickly pulled his scarf up until he looked like a small, pudgy caricature of Red Rider. The darkening sky had a fantastical sort of beauty, but Ben did not pause to admire it. It was too cold for him that he got going. At first, the wind was at his back, and things didn't seem so bad. In fact, it actually seemed to be helping him all along. At Canal Street, however, he had to turn right and almost fully into the wind. Now it seemed to be holding him back, as if it had business with him. His scarf helped a little, but not enough. His eyes throbbed in the moisture, and his nose froze to a cracked blaze. His legs were going numb. Several times, he struck his mittened hands into his armpits to warm them, get them up. The wind whooped and screamed, sometimes sounding almost human. Ben felt both frightened and exhilarated, frightened because he could not now understand stories he had read, such as Jack London's to build a fire where people actually froze to death. It would be all too possible to freeze to death on a night like this, a night when the temperature dropped to 15 below. The ex exhilaration was hard to explain. It was a lonely feeling, a somehow melancholy feeling. He was outside, he passed on the wings of the on the wings of the wind and none of the people beyond the brightly light lighted squares of the windows saw him. They were inside, inside where there was light and warmth. They didn't know he had passed them. Only he knew. It was a secret thing. The moving air burned like needles, but it was fresh and clean. White smoke jetted from his nose in neat little streams. And as sundown came, the last of the day, a cold yellow yellowy orange lying on the western horizon, the first star's cool diamond ships glimmering in the sky overhead, he came to the canal. He was only three blocks from home now and eager to feel the heat on his face and legs, moving the blood again, making it tingle. Whew. Still he paused. He's cold my heart. <laughs> Still he paused. The canal was frozen and its concrete sluice like a frozen river of rose milk. Its surface humped and cracked and cloudy. It was moveless, yet completely alive in this harshly puritanical winter light. In its own unique and difficulty, difficult beauty. Ben turned the other way southeast. Toward the barrens, when he looked in this direction, the wind was at his back again. It made his snow pants ripple and flap. The canal ran straight between in concrete walls for, per, for perhaps half a mile, then the concrete was gone, and the river sprawled its way into the barrens at this time of the year, skeletal world of icy brambles and jutting naked branches. A figure was standing on the ice 
down there. Ben stared at it and thought, there may be a man down there, but can he be wearing what it looks like he's wearing? It's impossible, isn't it? The figure was dressed in what appeared to be a white silver clown suit, rippled around him. In the polar wind, there was oversized orange shoes on his feet. They marched the pom-pom buttons, which ran down the front of his suit. One hand grasped a bundle of strings, which rose to a bright bell, uh, bunch of uh, balloons, and when Ben observed that the balloons were floating in his direction, he felt unreality wash over him more strongly. He closed his eyes, ru rubbed them, opened them. The, ball the balloons still appeared to be floating toward him. He heard Mr. Fazio's voice in his hair. He said, be careful of the frostbite, boy. It had to be... Ugh, it had to be a hallucination of or a mirage brought in brought on by some weird trick of the weather. There could be there could be a man down there on the ice, I suppose. It wasn't even technically possible. It was even technically possible he could be wearing a clown suit. But the balloons couldn't be floating toward Ben into the wind. <clears throat> yeah, that was just what was they happened to be that is just what they appeared to be doing. Ben, the clown on the ice, called. Ben thought that the voice was only in his mind, although it seemed he heard it with his ears. Want a balloon, Ben? There was something so evil in that voice, so awful, that Ben wanted to run as fast as he could, but his feet seemed as welded to the sidewalk as the teeter totters in the schoolyard were welded to the ground. They float, Ben. They all float. Try one and see. The clown began walking along the ice toward the canal bridge where Ben stood. Ben watched him come, not moving as he watched as a bird watches an approaching snake. The balloons should have burst into in the intense cold, but they did not. They floated above and ahead of the clown when they should have been streaming out behind him, trying to escape back into the barrens where some part of Ben's mind assured him this creature had come from in the first place. Now Ben noticed something else. Although the last of the daylight had struck a rosy glow across the ice of the canal, the, cl the clown cast no shadow, none at all. You'll like it here, Ben, the clown said. Now it was close enough so Ben could hear the clod clod sound its funny shoes made as they advanced over the une uneven ice. You'll like it here, I promise, and all the boys and girls I meet like it here because it's like Pleasure Island in Pinocchio and Never Never Land in Peter Pan. They never have to grow up, and that's what all the kitties want. So come on, see the sights, have a balloon, feed the elephants, ride the shoot the shoots. Oh, you'll like it, and oh, Ben, how you'll float. And in spite of his fear, Ben found that part of him did want a balloon. Who in all the world owned a balloon which would float into the wind? Who had even heard of such a thing? Yes, he wanted a balloon, and he wanted to see the clown's face, which was bent toward down toward the ice as if to keep it out of the uh, killer wind. What might have happened if the five o'clock whistle st atop the dairy town hall hadn't blown just then? Ben didn't know, didn't want to know. The important thing was that it did blow. A nice pick of sound drilling into the deep winter cold. The clown looked up as if startled in Ben Sartre's face. The mummy, oh my gosh. Some mummy was his first thought, accompanied by swoony horror that caused him to clamp his hands down viciously on the bridge's railing to keep from fainting. Of course, it hadn't been the mummy. It couldn't have been the mummy. Oh, there were Egyptian mummies, plenty of them. He knew that. But his first thought had been that it was the mummy, the dusty monster played by Boris Karloff in the old movie he had stayed up late to watch just last month on Shock Theater. <sighs> no, it wasn't that mummy. couldn't be. Movie monsters weren't real. Everyone knew that, even little kids. But it wasn't make that the clown was wearing, nor was the clown simply swaddled in a bunch of bandages. They were, there were bandages, most of them around its neck and wrists blowing back in the wind, but Ben could see the clown's face near clearly. It was deeply lined, the skin, a parchment map of wrinkles, tattered cheeks, and aired flesh. The skin of its forehead was split, but bloodless. Dead lips grinned back from a maw in which teeth leaned like tombstones. Its gums were pitted and black. Ben could see no eyes, but something glittered far back in the charcoal pits of those puckered sockets. Something like the cold jewels in the 
eyes of Egyptian scarab beetles, and although the wind was the wrong way, it seemed to him that he could smell cinnamon and spice rotting cerements treated with weird drugs, drugs, sand, bl sand blood so old that it dried to flakes and grains of dust. We all float down here, the mummy clown croaked, and Ben realized with fresh horror that somehow it had reached the bridge. It was now just below him, reaching up with a dry and twisted hand from which flaps of skin rustled like pennons, a hand through which bone like yellow ivory showed. One almost fleshless finger caressed the tip of his boot. Ben's paralysis broke. He pounded the rest of the way across the bridge, with five, the five o'clock whistle still shrieking in his ears. It only ceased as he reached the far side. It had to be a mirage. had to be. The clown simply could not have come so far during the whistle's ten or fifteen second blast. But his fear was not a mirage either. Neither were the hot tears which spurted from his eyes and froze on his cheeks as a second... A second after being shed, he ran, boots thudding on the sidewalk, and behind him he could hear the mummy in the clown suit climbing up from the canal, ancient stony fingernails scraping crossed iron, old tendons creased, creaking like dry hinges. He could hear the arid whistle of its breath pulling in and pushing out of nostrils as devoid of moisture as the tunnels under the Great Pyramid. He could smell its shred of, uh, a shroud of sandy spices, and he knew that. In a moment, its hands, as fleshless as the geometrical constructions he made with his erector set, would descend upon his shoulders. If they would turn him around, he would stare into the wrinkled, smiling face. The dead river of its breath would wash over him. Uh, those black eye sockets with their deep, glowing depths would bend over. The toothless mouth would yawn, and he would have his balloons. Oh, yes, and the balloons he wanted. All the balloons he wanted. But when he reached the corner of his own street, sobbing and winded, his heart slamming, crazed, leaping beats into his ear, ears when he at last looked uh, back over his shoulder, the street was empty. The arched bridge with its low concrete sides and its old-fashioned cobblestone pavement pavings were also empty. He could not see the canal itself, but he felt that he could. He could see nothing there either, no... no if the mummy had not been a hallucination, if no, if the mummy had not been a hallucination or, or barrage, mirage, if it had been real, it would be waiting under the bridge like the troll in the story of the three Billy Groat scruff. Under, hiding under, Ben hurried home, looking back every step, few steps under the, until the door was safely shut and locked behind him. He explained to his mother, who was so tired from a particularly hard day at the mill, that she had not, in truth, much missed Tim that he had been helping Mrs. Douglas count books. Then he sat down to a dinner of noodles and Sonny's leftover turkey. He stuffed three helpings into himself, and the mummy seemed more distant dreamlike with each helping. It was not real. Those things were never real. They came fully to life only between the commercials of the late-night TV movies and during the Saturday matinees, where if you were lucky, you could get two monsters for a quarter. And if you had an extra quarter, you could buy all the popcorn you could eat. No, they were not real. TV monsters and movie monsters and comic book monsters were not real. Not until you went to bed, couldn't sleep. Not until the last four pieces of candy wrapped in tissue and kept under the pillow against the evils of the night were gobbled up. Not until the bed itself turned into the lake of rancid dreams and the wind screamed outside and you were afraid to look at the window because there might be a face there. An ancient grinning face that had not, that had rot, not rotted but simply... Sweating. They're not right, but simply dried like an old leaf. Its eyes sunken, diamonds pushed deep into dark sockets. Not until you saw one ripped and claw like hand holding out a bunch of balloons. See the sights, have a balloon, feed the elephants, ride the shoot the shoot. Ben O, oh, Ben, how you'll float. Part 12 of chapter 4. And this will be the end, We're almost near the end. Ben awoke with a gasp, the dream of the mummy still on him. Panicked by the close, vibrating dark all around him, he jerked and the, door, and the root stopped supporting him and poked him in the back again as if in exasperation. He saw light and scrambled for it. He crawled out into afternoon sunlight 
and the babble of the stream, and everything fell into place again. It was summer, not winter. The mummy had not carried him away to its desert crypt. Ben had simply hidden from the big kids in a sandy hole under a half-uprooted tree. He was in the barrens. Henry and his buddies had gone to a town in a small way, had gone to town in a small way on a couple of kids playing downstream because they hadn't been able to find Ben and go to town on him in a big way. Ta-ta, boys, it was a real baby Dan. Believe me, you're better off without it. Ben looked glumly down at his ruined clothes. His mother was going to give him 16 different flavors of holy old hell. He had slept just long enough to stiffen up. He slid down the embankment and then began to walk along the stream, wincing at every step. He was a medley of aches and pains. It felt like Spike Jones was playing a fast tune on broken glass inside most of his muscles. There seemed to be dry there seemed to be dried or drying blood on every inch of exposed skin. The damn building kids be gone anyway, he called and sold himself. He wasn't sure how long he had slept, but even if it had only been half an hour, the encounter with Henry and his friends would have convinced Denver and his pal that some other place, like Timbuktu maybe, would be better for their health. Ben plugged, grumbling along, knowing that the big kids came back now, he would not stand a chance of outrunning them. He hardly cared. He rounded an elbow bend in the stream and just stood there for a moment looking. The dam builders were still there. One of them was indeed stuttering Bill Denbro. He was kneeling beside the other boy who was propped against the stream bank in a sitting position. The other kid's head was thrown so far back that his Adam's apple stood out like a triangle plug, triangular plug. There was... Dry blood around his nose, on his chin, and painted along his neck in a couple of streams. He had something white clasped loosely in his, in one hand. Shuddering Bill looked around sharply and saw Bell, Ben standing there. Ben saw with dismay that something was, ver was very wrong with the boy propped up on the bank. Denver was, ob was obviously scared to death. He thought miserably, won't this day ever end? I wonder if you, you, you could help me build Denver said, hey, his aspirators are empty. I think he might be, his face froze, turned red. He dug at the word, stuttering like a machine gun. Spittle flew from his lips, and it took almost 30 seconds worth of zzz before Ben realized Denver was trying to say the other kid might be dying. All right, what did I... That's the end of ch <coughs> chapter four um, in Stephen King's It. In the next video, uh, in the next video, we will be getting into chapter five. Bill Denbro beats the devil, part one. And without for, uh, sorry, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell, and you stay safe, you stay healthy, and you try to stay cool in the heat.